My family recently played a fun little game, I mean, we made it up, at the dinner table, where each of us came up with the name of the memoir that we would write. Like, if I was going to write a memoir, what would its name be? The second iteration of the game became actually funnier when we named each other's memoirs. But whenever I think of that question, I am absolutely certain that if I were ever to write a memoir, its title would be Six Days Till Sunday. There's just that reality when I wake up on a Monday morning knowing, well, now there's six more days till the next worship service. It's an element of my life, that cycle of six days till Sunday. And within the cycle of that on each given week is the larger placement of the church calendar, which governs much of mine and my family's life. We begin a new church year, high and excited and ready to go in September. We take a, a short, deep breath after we get everything kicked into gear, uh, and then it's holidays, then it's Advent, then it's Christmas. And as soon as Christmas is over, when you're ready to take a break, you're like, uh-oh, it's almost Lent. So then Lent, and then Easter, and then post-Easter, and then graduations, and then saying goodbye to everybody and sending them off to the summer, whereby I imagine I will catch up with everything that is on the back burner, except before I know it, it's August, and it's time to be ready for September. And then I repeat, and repeat, and repeat. So much of all of our lives is about repetition. One of the first things I remember learning that was, seemed so counterintuitive uh, when I was serving a church in Florida was that the school year governed the lives of everybody, whether they had children or not. But if you've lived that routine your entire life, like now it's summer, we'll take a little time off church, then you do it, no matter whether the original excuse was there or not. The favorite uh, cross procession, doing it the same way we always do it, story uh, that goes, uh, a lady comes back to a church, she's been away from the church for a while, and she's there uh, during Holy Week, and every Holy Week they have a procession where the cross comes down the center aisle uh, and is put up in the front. Uh, and about a third of the way, they, they kneel with this very tall cross. And then they stand up and they carry it till they get about another third of the way in. And they kneel and pause and then stand up again. After the service, she said, I, I love that you're still doing that. It surprises me now that we took those beams out of the roof that you still bend down to get the cross under them. We're formed in our repetitions. And it's amazing when you start to think about it, how much we re repeat, how much becomes a part of our routine. Have you ever said that to yourself? I feel like all I'm ever doing is figuring out what my next meal is. Or you can hear in a kid's voice, here we go again. And we have the saying, history repeats itself. In our series on the eight R's of resurrection, this week, our word is repeat. But really, that's been our word the whole time. The Latin prefix, R-E, means again. All of our words, whether we were repenting or reorienting or refusing or reducing or recycling, all of our words have been about doing a thing again. Because there is power in that repetition, which is noticeable when you start to realize just how many words use that Latin R-E prefix. In our dictionary, there are 12,000 of them. When we were sermon, filming the sermon teaser, Duncan's like, you know you used about three R-E words without even meaning to. It's just a recognition that much of our life is about patterns of behavior and much of our formation is about continuing our patterns of, of behavior 
So as we look to the wisdom of environmental conservation to reflect, there's one of those RE words again, on the dying and rising of our lives as we follow in the dying and rising of Christ, how is the salvation that Jesus offers us mending the brokenness of our own repetitions? In a season of letting go and coming out of a year of quarantine and laying fallow, we ask the question what life is blooming in us and what do we wish to make the focal point of our lives as we follow in the way of Christ to the cross, through the empty grave, and into a life of resurrection. We were called to recognize our own finiteness and limitations on Ash Wednesday when we were reminded from dust we came to dust we shall return. We are called in Lent to a journey of orienting our lives to the priorities of our faith rather than the voices of the culture around us who insidiously form us in ways counter even to our own desires and certainly counter to the ways of peace. We are called to imagine collectively and by the power of God that we can shape our lives differently in the light of God's abundance and through the self-sacrificing love of Jesus. And that that difference that we make in our own lives when accumulated with all the lives makes a difference in the life of the world. In the early 1800s, fur trappers would start to track a land route through the Mountain West. The trail that had eluded Lewis and Clark, whose journey farther north found them only the Lolo and Limhai passes through the Bitter Route Mountains, not good for wagons in any day and age. Those fur trappers and traders would start to piece together a route that we would later call the Oregon Trail. In 1839, the Peoria Party would set out from Illinois in a rather ill-fated quest to secure Oregon for the United States. That's literally what their goal was. We we're going to secure it from the clutches of the Hudson Bay Company. Nine of them, only nine of them, would make it all the way to Oregon, but it would pave the way for the next party in 1841, the Barlson Bidwell Party, to be the first immigrant group credited with using the Oregon Trail to immigrate to the West. By 1842, the second such group would number 100 people, and by 1843, we would see what we call the Great Migration. In that year, 700 to 1,000 immigrants traveled to Oregon on that trail. And overall, by 1869, when the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad would supplant the Oregon Trail as a means for getting west, over 400,000 settlers crossed that trail and its direct subsidiaries to move from the Midwest to the Far West. Today, as we well know here in Idaho, you can find vestiges of that trail still visible. In Missouri, in Iowa, in Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, Oregon, each of those states claims some space where you can see and spot original wagon ruts from those 400,000 people pursuing a dream and a hope of making a new way of life, a new tomorrow. For each of those individual journeys, it was a first. It was new, but the vestiges of that trail that we see today exist not because one person made that one journey, but because 400,000 times that same journey was repeated by new people over and over until the scars and traces were literally paved into the fabric of our world. Lack of repetition since 1869 means that many of those trails are now passed away from the memory of the earth. But if that 
train of people still existed today, it would still be transforming the very face of our world. Not a single passage, but by sheer repetition of a journey into the unknown were established trails made. Which brings us to today. Here we are again at Palm Sunday. Here we are again to our journey with palm branches, whether those make sense in the mountain west or not, to welcome a Savior riding on a donkey. Why? Why do we do this again? Don't we know how the story ends? Why rehearse the story again and again? Why act like we don't know its ending and that we don't need to hear or rehearse it once more? The Palm Sunday story is really a much older story than all of that. It's more Oregon Trail than Transcontinental Railroad, though in the 21st century we'd like everything to be as direct and fast as it might be. We know the timing in which this story is set is a pivotal time of pilgrimage for the Jews. A time when Jews, scattered across countries by the dominant world powers around them, would make a necessary pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the pivotal event in the Jewish formation, the Exodus. More specifically, the Passover. When Jews in slavery in Egypt put the blood of the Lamb over their doorposts so that the angel of death, the tenth of the plagues of Egypt, would pass over their houses, not touching them, letting them live, from the power of death. It is this plague that would free them to make their mad dash across the Red Sea and to the Promised Land. Slightly less a mad dash to the Promised Land since it took 40 years. They gather every year in their holy city to remember this story, to tell it over and over and over again, to repeat a story of salvation, a story of God's power of emancipation and restoration, a story of life on the other side of death. And the same journey they made is the journey that Jesus, a penitent Jew, was making with his disciples. A Jew among Jews, they made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. It's the festival, John says, is being celebrated. It's why there's so many crowds around Jerusalem this whole week, because it's filled past the brim with people from outside here on pilgrimage to travel a well-paved road of divine storytelling. And Jesus sets his story, the story of the cross we know so well, within this history, so that we might rehearse it not once, but time and time again. The disciples, our texts tell us, have no idea. that They miss that completely. They miss the significance of the Passover timing. They miss the significance of Jesus riding on a donkey, which Zephaniah said their Savior would do. They miss it when Jesus breaks bread at that table, or a table not at all like it, on Thursday night and says, this is my body I'm breaking for you. They would miss the understanding when he hung on the cross or when he laid in the tomb, and even they would miss it when he wasn't in the tomb three days later. Jesus is an ancient story given life again in their midst, and they don't see it until it's all done. They have to repeat what's happened to figure out all the layers of significance of that event. An event which was an unmistakable reminder that the God of emancipation is still working alive around us and through God's power, destroying death and domination to bring God's people back to life again and again and again. 
The story is so profound, you don't capture its meaning by telling it once. Like the exodus before us, it begs to be rehearsed as the very fabric of our lives, to form the wheel ruts and the roots of its power that lay unmistakable pathways of peace through our lives and into the life of the world, that we cannot help but live this way because we're formed to go this way and no other in the constant repetition of self-sacrificing love, of restoring peace, and yes, of abundant life for all. So everything we've talked about the last six weeks, we will do it again and again and again. Until the doing of these activities isn't just second nature to us, it is our first nature, our every instinct, our way of life, so that we see these signs and symbols around us and react accordingly in the way of Christ. Most of you know my children are all required to play an instrument. They were given the option to choose which instrument, but it wasn't an option to have an instrument. In fact, most of them take piano and an instrument, and they take lessons on each of those each week. Elizabeth's flute teacher is sitting right in front of me. I'm about to confess things that don't surprise you, because when they go to practice, they play through a piece and say, I'm done practicing. And I say, no. <laughs> and she or he or they will say, can't I be done? I've already played all my pieces. And I say, you've barely begun. And they say every time, but I've played everything I've been told to practice this week. And I say, and you've mastered it all? And then I won't repeat what happens after that. You see, it's not about practicing it once. It's about playing it again and again until you live the music you're making. It beats in your blood. If you're going to play the piece, I usually say, don't you want to play it well? I won't repeat their response to that one either. We repeat again and again because the very mundaneness of that repetition is what forms wheel ruts of love in our lives. We take up our cross, as Luke tells us, daily because daily we need to be reminded, reoriented, and redirected to live our life in the way of Jesus. And somewhere along the line, that becomes the only way we can imagine living. We are, those few of us, but all of us, standing on holy ground. It's not holy ground because there's anything unique about this space. It's not holy ground because God waved a magic wand or said the right words or we sprinkled water on it. It's not holy ground because we put the word church on it, or Christian on it. It's holy ground because day in and day out, week in and week out, the travelers through this space have paved it with righteousness and peace, with love and grace. We are standing on the holy ground because we have wrestled here with our faith in repetitive journeys through generations we are standing on holy ground because a holy people gather here to rehearse a holy story over and over until the holy doesn't wipe away anymore. That's right, this sermon is one giant advertisement for weekly worship attendance. But we repeat the journey. Because every time we come to an old story, we're a new person. My old uh, philosophy days wants to quote a little Heraclitus. You can't step in the same river twice. Because when you step in it again, it's not the same river and you're not the same person. 
So we come again to an old story in a new way that we might be formed in faith by God's love. God's love that will go places in this week to come that we would never have imagined or desired. God's love that will end this week with a radical determination that love and life wins. And that's something we need to be reminded of daily. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.